Well, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful and breezy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. It's uh, wonderful to be able to uh, celebrate this day with you. We're going to look at Revelation on Mother's Day. Yeah. All right. We're going to look. We're actually going to uh, look at something uh, that is, I think, going to take us through the first three and a half years of the tribulation. How is that for Mother's Day message? That's just great. Three and a half years of, of tribulation that will be poured out on this earth. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we will uh, begin. Father, thank you for this time together today, and thank you for the opportunity we have to meet and to talk about some things this morning that have uh, just come to our attention, and, and we realize that you are the one that's in control, and we thank you for that reality. We ask your blessing on this time. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. And this morning, we're just going to read the first eight verses of this chapter. Revelation chapter 6, and I want to begin reading at verse 1. And I saw... When the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat up thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and, the po and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with beasts of the earth. This morning, before we really dig into this, I, I want to try to address something that has come up, and I, and I kind of... Uh, I talked about it a little bit uh, a while back uh, when we first began this. What, what people have done through the years, it, it, when they get into how to understand the Bible, they, they come up with all kinds of different ideas. And one of the things that has happened over, I don't know, probably the last 30 or 40 years is people have put together books, and these books contain ideas that present all these different views. And this book is, is one I have. I took this picture last night. I apologize for the clarity of it a little bit. But this book was written a few years ago, and it, it presents all the different views on how people understand the book of Revelation You'll see there the first one is the preterist view. And that was the view, and we talked about this, that was the view that says that most of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 through chapter 19, most of the book of the Revelation was fulfilled before A.D. 70. It was fulfilled when Jerusalem fell. 
And all those prophecies you find about the the beast and the false prophet and the mark of the beast and all of that has already happened. Uh, so, So this guy, Kenneth Gentry, was the one who wrote that chapter. The next one was called the is called the idealist view, and and that's the idea that or that's the the concept that it's basically the book of Revelation is a battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, and God's going to win, but you can't understand. We shouldn't understand these things as literal historical events. These things happen, you know, figuratively or something like that. The third one is the progressive dispensationalist view, and we'll talk about that some at some point when we get into Revelation chapter 20. But basically what they say is that Jesus Christ is now seated on David's throne. That Jesus, that we are in a form of the kingdom now. And, and so they incorporate Revelation chapter 20 back into the present day. Well, let me tell you, Jesus isn't on the throne and the guy who wrote the fourth view is the guy you need to listen to. He's the right one. Dr. Robert Thomas, if you ever see a book that Dr. Robert Thomas wrote, you need to get it. Dr. Thomas was a great, great Bible teacher. And I, uh, I really uh, enjoy reading what he has written through the years. My point in all of this is to show you that these books can be, these kinds of books are very popular. They can be very helpful in a certain way if, if you understand some things that we're going to talk about. Now, there are other views, there are other uh, concepts or other doctrines that, that come up. Uh, the doctrine of the rapture. This one was. Uh, a book that came out many years ago. You can tell uh, I've, I, that's an old copy of it. But they present the, the doctrine of the rapture. Did it occur pre-tribulation? Was it, did it occur, does it occur in the middle of the tribulation? Or does it occur after the tribulation? And, and uh, so I think Gleason Archer presents it that it occurs after the tribulation yeah, Doug Moo was in the middle of the tribulation, and Paul Feinberg was the uh, pre-tribulation. He's the one you need to listen to. Okay, he's the right one. Now, they updated it a few years ago. And you'll see this. This is a little bit newer copy of it. But uh, you'll see the, uh, the different authors up there. Craig Bleising was the guy, he was the pre-trib guy, and the other two, Doug Moo was post, or mid-trib, and this Alan Holtberg was, was uh, the post-trib. And then you had this one about the millennium. When is, what about the millennium? Um, there's a really famous guy, this first guy, George Eldon Ladd. George Eldon Ladd taught at Fuller Seminary for many, 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 many years. And George Eldon Ladd is probably in my opinion, one of the most influential theologians in America in the late 20th and early 21st century. We are still reaping the whirlwind that he sowed in many, many, many circles. Have you ever heard of Bethel Church in Redding, California? He provided the theological basis for what's going on up there for the International House of Prayer in Kansas City and so on. It's not just, what I'm saying is it's not just prophecy, it's everything that he taught at Fuller was just horrific, was, was just tragic. It's, it's, anyway, the guy you need to listen to on this one is Herman Hoyt. He was the correct one. Um, and then you have this, the, the three views of the millennium and beyond. I said all of these books can be helpful. Books like this can be helpful. You've also got books, and I didn't take pictures of them. I've got a stack of them, like about that high at home. They cover things like the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, Well, maybe I put this one up there. I did, yeah. Four views on hell. Did you know there were four views on hell? 
Look, you have the literal view. I mean, that's the view we, we take. It's literal. It's, it's not metaphorical. There's not a purgatory. It's not conditional. There, there are views on salvation, four views on salvation. I mean, there's four views on the law and the gospel. There's four views on sanctification. There, there's all these different views. So people get books like this, and they read them, and they come away horribly confused. Because these books will not tell you definitively which is the correct view. They can't. Uh, if they did, they, if, if they did it, wouldn't, it wouldn't get published, okay? So my concern about this, they don't help us determine which books are valid and ruling out the others. The, the, the other thing, they simply present perspectives and possibilities that some people embrace. They're convenient. I, I mean, they're very, it's very convenient. If I want to write a research paper, or if I want to do an article or something, I can just go to that book and I can get primary source information from what you know, Matt, Matt likes to get primary source information and use that when we publish Foundation Magazine. We don't, we don't like to take what somebody says about what, some, what something is. All right, so I think there are certain qualifications, and I'm just going to list these real quick for us this morning. You have to understand you have to understand the essential message of the Bible, what the Bible really teaches. You, you, you know, the Bible has a storyline, doesn't it? The Bible has a plot line. The Bible starts with creation, and then, it, then there were events that happened after the creation. There was the fall and the flood and the call of Abraham or Abram. You had, uh, we're, we're going through uh, uh, Exodus. How did, how did Israel get down into Egypt in the first place? Why are they down there? Well, the rest of the book of Genesis, from Genesis uh, chapter uh, basically 39 on, tells us how they got down into Egypt. And Moses is bringing them up out of Egypt, right? Right? going back into the promised land. Why are they doing that? Well, it's all tied back to the covenant that God made with Abraham. I'm going to give you and your descendants all this promised land. So you have the journey in, in numbers. You have the journey from Egypt up into, uh, uh, ultimately, up into the promised land. And, and you can go on through the rest of the Old Testament. You go into the New Testament, and, and you see this story. You have to understand there is a storyline behind all this. And one of the things that is so important to feature about that storyline is this, salvation. Salvation from sin. God saves sinners. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think Paul makes a very, very important point to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I mean, we, we know that. But notice what he says in verse 15, before he gets to verse 16. Paul tells Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. See, the whole point of Scripture is to teach about salvation. I mean, you read, read the Old Testament law, all right? What is the Old Testament law? What, it, what is one of the most important things we learn from the Old Testament law? We're sinners. We're sinners, and we cannot save ourselves. And, and the law tells us that in order to be right with God, we have to be perfect. But the entirety, of, that means we have to keep the, all the law all the time. And we can't do that. And that's the point. So 
Paul tells Timothy that these scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament should be able to be utilized to lead a person to Jesus Christ, to faith in Jesus Christ. When I was in Bible college, one of the assignments we had in our personal evangelism class was if, if you're witnessing to a Jewish person, how would you witness to this Jewish person? Would you use the New Testament? Not on your life. So could you use the Old Testament? Could you show from the Old Testament any place where it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Well, I, I, I can't remember the text. I, I just read it the other day. I think it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. There is not a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, and you, you, could, you should be able to take the Old Testament and lead a Jewish person to understand that Jesus Christ is his Messiah and he needs to come to faith in Christ to be saved. Anyway, you have to understand, I think, to, to get into these books, and, and again, they are helpful, but you have to understand there is a message to the Bible. Secondly, you have to understand a substantial amount of Bible doctrine. Uh, you know, one of, the things, one of the things that I think those books do is they will pull verses out of context. They, they will pull a verse from here that, that isn't talking about, uh, you know, let's, let's say hell per se. They'll, they'll pull that out of its context and use it to uh, promote the, the view of purgatory or to promote the view of conditional mortality or something like that. So you have to understand the, a good understanding of Bible doctrine. And then this last one, you have to understand good principles, or good, you have to have a good handle on principles or rules of interpretation. And I'm, I'm taking way more time with this than I want to, so I'm just going to jump over to this. Uh, you have to understand the grammar of a passage. My, my dad was always silly about stuff like this. You know, your, your grammar would be upset if she knew what you were doing now. Guess what he did with syntax? Why do they have to tax my cigarettes? Why do they have to tax my, you know, whatever? Yeah, I rolled my eyes too for years. That's what I grew up listening to, okay? And then the context. What these are, the syntax are the arrangement of the words in a sentence. Uh, you have to understand the meaning of True, the, the truth intention that the author means. You have to understand th something like exegesis. That's not talking about Jesus Christ. Exegesis means leading out. Look at John chapter 1. I, I love this. John chapter 1, verse 18 John writes, John the Apostle writes, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who's the only begotten Son? Jesus. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. That word declared is the Greek word exegesis. In other words, what Jesus did as the only begotten Son, He explained the Father. And you go through the Gospel of John, and you see him doing that over and over and over and over again. He's declaring the Father. He's exegeting the Father to the people. He did it in his life. He did it in his teaching. He did it in his death and resurrection. That's what Jesus was about. And we pay attention to the context of passages. That's so important. I, I, heard, I heard somebody say this years ago. What is the number one rule of real estate? Location, number two. Location, number three. Location. The number one rule of Bible interpretation is context, 
Number two, context. Number three, context. You have to look at passages in their context. I can't, I can't stress that enough because that's what a lot, that's what happens a lot when you get those kinds of books that, w- that we saw earlier. This was a, I, I thought about doing something like this. When I was in college, we had to memorize this golden rule of interpretation. And I, I used to know it. I don't, my mind is gone now. But what's left of it? David Cooper was a Bible teacher down in Los Angeles for many years. Uh, he had, I think it was uh, Bible Research Society. He, he came up with this, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in light of related passages and axiomatic. That axiomatic means self-evident, means obvious unquestionable. Axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. In other words, just take the Bible for what it says. You you understand it for, for what it says. If I read an article in a newspaper about uh, a car wash that's opening up, having a grand opening, I'm not going to go there to that rest, to that uh, to that restaurant, yeah. I'm not going to go there and order a hamburger. Because I think, well, they're they're using the language figuratively. They're using it metaphorically. No, I understand. They're going to open up a car wash, and I'm going to take my car there and get it washed. Or I'll have Jeanette take it there and get it washed. I don't know. But anyway, I'm saying all this because something happened in the 1960s and 1970s with all of this. In the 1960s, the culture blew apart. In America. In the 1970s, the culture in the church got just obliterated because you had, you had debates about things like inerrancy and creationism and things like salvation and the church. You had all these things coming on. And so what happened was people changed the ideas and the concepts about interpretation and application and and illustrate and so on and observation and everything. What I'm trying to say is this, that I believe from the very beginning of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, what we have is the very hour of temptation that John had written about in chapter 3. We have this breaking out on the earth. And notice again what he says in chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now the question is, all right, well, who is this rider on the white horse? There there are three three options that have been proposed. First of all, it's Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what it says. He goes out conquering and to conquer. And that's, that's what happens. And you compare that to Revelation 19. See, it's the, he's the rider on the white horse because he's riding a white horse there. No, it's not Christ. Notice, notice how he's described in verse 2. He has a bow. In Revelation 19, what does Jesus have? A sword that goes out of his mouth. And with that sword, he smites the nations. But not only that, notice in verse 2 again, it says he has a crown. This crown was given unto him. That word crown is not the word diadem. The word diadem is, is a crown of royalty, a crown of splendor, a crown of majesty. This is the word stephanos. It's, it's a little wreath. 
So this one is, this person on this horse is given a crown, a Stephanos, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer with his bow. It is interesting that he simply has the weapon. He doesn't have the tool. What goes with a bow? Arrows. But he's not given the arrows. And the idea here seems to be that he uses this weapon as a threat. He's using it to intimidate, to manipulate. In other words, what I, I like how Charles Ryrie talks about this. He says, this really is a great description of Cold War. This is what happens in, in Cold War at the onset. You know, there's, there are all these negotiations and all this intrigue and all this deception and all this manipulation that goes on behind the scenes. And that's the idea here. He, this, this person, and I believe it is the Antichrist, he is going out pretending to be Christ, and, and he is manipulating, he is building his coalition. So, You'll notice that it is from the very beginning the Lamb who breaks these seals. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this quickly because I found this next one interesting. It's the Lamb who breaks the seals, but notice it is God who determines the extent and effects of the third seal. Listen to verse 6 again. Notice what he says. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts. You see that? Remember back in chapter 4, we saw the four beasts. Where were the four beasts? What were they around? They were around a throne. And it described the person on the throne. Where is it? It describes the person on the throne uh, in verse 3 of chapter 4. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So it is the person who is sitting on the throne in chapter 6 and verse 6 that is speaking. And notice what he says. A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That is God the Father speaking. That is God the Father decreeing this. He is saying this. He is, he is allowing this, uh, this the, the rider on the third horse, he is allowing him to do this. All right? He's the one that determines this. And the, and the first four seals involve four things. Death, by sword, by famine, by pestilence, and wild beasts. And if you go into the Old Testament, and we don't have time to go into all these passages. I've got, I've got a number of passages. But just look with me at Exodus, sorry, Ezekiel 14. Because this, this just really drives this point home. Sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts are all instruments of God's wrath. All right, sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. And there's a lot more uh, text that you, that you can see where it talks about this. Go back to verse 12, and he says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, All right, Son of man, who is speaking? Not Ezekiel, it's God. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and I will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should, not, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. I mean, think about that. How corrupt is the nation of Israel or the nation of Judah at that time? Well, he compares it to three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And we know those men were 
extraordinarily righteous in God's sight. But even their righteousness wasn't going to help. All right, so that's how bad it is. If I cause noisome beasts, noisome is evil. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beast. Anyway, he talks about sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. But go down to verse 21 and notice what he says about these four things. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send, watch, my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beasts, and pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. So God claims that these four things are his, uh, are his instruments of judgment. So what God is saying is from the very beginning of the tribulation, it is his wrath that is being poured out. It is not the wrath of man. He utilizes certain things, but it is ultimately God that does this. The interesting thing about Matthew or about Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, if you compare it with Matthew 24, the same things Jesus talked about. And when Jesus, I, I'm really condensing this because we gotta, we got to move on through this. When Jesus is talking about this, he's talking about what is going to happen at the very beginning of the tribulation. You'll go, go keep your finger in Revelation, go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Jesus answering the question the disciples ask, what are, is going to be the sign of your coming? Or what, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age in verse 3? Uh, in verse 4, he starts off, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no that, Don't be deceived by, by this. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The, the, deception, the idea of deception is not just prevalent in our day, it will continue, it will, it will be exacerbated, it will be increased in the tribulation. I mean, are, are you amazed? I, I, I shouldn't be. But isn't it interesting how easy people are deceived today? You know, it's just... Sometimes it, it's, it's mind-numbing. How can people actually believe that, that someone like uh, David Koresh was Jesus Christ? How could someone believe that Charles Manson was Jesus Christ? How could people believe that? But, but they do. And the idea there is that the, these Christ and these professing uh, messiahs will increase the rider on the white horse goes out conquering and to conquer and that's the idea in matthew in matthew 6 or matthew 24 verse 6 he says you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars now watch what he says see that ye be not troubled all right don't be don't be alarmed by this the the when you hear about Wars and rumors of wars. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In verse 7, he says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. The second rider, or the rider on the second horse, goes out conquering and to conquer, or not conquering, he goes out and he takes peace from the earth. What's involved in peace? How, how do you know you have peace? You know, it's interesting to me, the Bible is very specific about what constitutes peace. You want to know what constitutes peace? According to Leviticus 26, an abundance of food, the absence of sword, and harmful beasts go together with peace and safety. In Jeremiah 14, sword, famine, pestilence, and false prophets go together with lack of peace. 
Is there peace in this world according to these things today? No. But the world is, is crying for peace. Jeremiah said, uh, further says that diseases, sword, famine, and wild beasts are the result of God withdrawing peace from the earth. The Old Testament teaches true peace and safety exist when the following four truths are, or conditions are met. Number one, when Israel's regathered into the promised land. Is Israel regathered there now? In part, not totally. In part. A great world ruler reigns. A new temple is built in Jerusalem. And a covenant of peace is made with Israel. These sound familiar at all in relationship to the tribulation? They do. At the beginning of the tribulation, Israel will be regathered into her land. At the beginning of the tribulation, a great world ruler will arise. At the beginning of the tribulation, a new temple will be built in Jerusalem. I just heard some more uh, information this week. They are the, they, uh, the Jewish people and even Muslims are ramping up the calls and concerns about building a temple today. And a covenant of peace is made. Remember what we talked about last week? When, when uh, the, the tribulation begins, what is going to happen according to Daniel chapter 9 that he, that is the Antichrist, will confirm, will enforce a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. But none of that is going to last. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fall to pieces. Israel is going to be scattered to the four winds again, according to Matthew and according to uh, uh, um, Daniel and, and other prophets. There will be a, a great world. Uh, there will be a great world ruler that will break that covenant with Israel in the midst of the week. Paul talks about this amazingly in Second Thessalonians two, when he says the man of sin, the Antichrist, will go into the temple and he will demand. He will demand that people worship him as God, and then the temple will be rebuilt and the covenant of peace will be made. All of these things are true when Israel is established in the kingdom. All of these things. They will be regathered to the land. We talked about that. Uh, Ezekiel uh, 20, Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, all of those passages, Jeremiah 31, all of those passages. A great world ruler will reign. I love uh, Isaiah I think it's Isaiah 32. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. A new temple. The new temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. You want to learn about the new temple? Read Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. That, that new temple will be magnificent. The new temple will be spectacular. It will, it will make Solomon's temple pale in comparison. The millennial temple will be much, much larger you realize that where the temple has to be located, it cannot be built on that spot right now because it's too small. The area is too small. Something is going to have to happen. Well, the Bible tells us there will be great geological changes that take place for that temple to be built. And then we see... Back in Revelation and, and Matthew, we see these things. Go back to Revelation chapter 6, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with these, these last two things. Uh, in Revelation chapter 6, the third writer is sent out. And he, he, he is sent out, it says, with, with balances, with a scale in verse, uh, in verse 7, he, or in verse 6, when, when he opened, sorry, in verse 5, he had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Now, a penny was a day's wage. 
and these measure, the measure of wheat was uh, a day's supply of food that could feed one person. Think about that. If you're, if you're a, a husband or if you're a father and you have a family to feed, the only, and, and you, it's going to cost you a day just to get food to feed one person in your family. And you have a choice, a measure of wheat for a penny or barley for a penny. I mean, it becomes very, very, very expensive to live. I'm glad it's not that way right now. <laughs> it's getting, it's, you know, can you see where this is going? But notice what he says. This is, this is God. See thou hurt not the oil and wine. The things that wealthy people, the things that powerful people can afford. The, these are not essentials. Wheat and barley are essentials. Oil and wine are luxuries. So you have famine coming, a scarcity of food, high prices. And then you have in, in Revelation chapter 7, or chapter 6, the, the last verse, or the last two verses, he says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast. See, all those beasts around there had announced, all those beasts around that throne are announcing these coming judgments, these coming, the coming of these horsemen. And he says, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. That's, that's the word. Pale is the Greek word chloros. Does that sound somewhat familiar to us? We get the word chlorine from that word. This is a chlorinated horse. See, chlorine isn't good for us. We should have saltwater pools. No. <laughs> this this chlor it, it is a... It is a gruesome looking picture. It's kind of greenish in color. And it's very intimidating to see this horse, to see something like this color. And, and notice, notice what it says. This is the only rider that's named. See that? Death. Death. This is a rider that goes out and physically, physically takes life. But that's not all. Notice what follows him. Hell. Why is that significant? Because it's not just the physical punishment. It's also the spiritual. Souls of people go to hell if they don't know Jesus Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. This is going to be a, a terrible, terrible time. How do I know that? Look what he says. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill, and he's reiterating this, because I think he's talking about all uh, four of these, to kill with what? Sword, famine, hunger, death, pestilence, and wild beasts, the beasts of the earth. What were those? God's four sore judgments. Well, is it really going to be that bad? What has he said? One fourth of the world's population will die at this point. And we're, we're just halfway through the tribulation, I think. We're just, th this is just kind of the opening salvo. You imagine that? One fourth, sorry, one fourth of the world's population in a three and a half year period of time. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of people who will not survive. 
And the worst is yet to come. It's not going to get better. It's going to get a whole lot worse. As we'll see as, as this unfolds. Uh, when, the, when the fifth seal and the sixth seal and the seventh seals are open. I, I thank God that at this point, you know, when we'll go through, we'll finish chapter six next week. But I thank God that he put chapter seven in there. I really do. Because you're going to have chapter seven, we're going to learn about the 144,000 Jewish men, males, who are devoted to God, who are witnesses for him. And we're going to learn about the impact of their ministry on the souls of people who will be martyred because of their testimony, because of the witnesses, the 144,000 witnesses' testimony. They have a, a massive, massive number of people who will be saved during their ministry. And I think, I think chapter 7 is there to give us some hope, to give us some light at the end of the tunnel, because what's going to come after chapter 7 is really going to get bad. Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us, and thank you for the opportunity we have to consider some of this. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to take things to heart in the time that you've given us. We're thankful that we will not be here to see this terrible time. But if... If we are raptured today, tomorrow, next week, we know many, many, many friends and neighbors and loved ones who will endure this or beginning the beginning of it. And I pray right now that you would help us to be the witnesses for them, to them, that we need to be. Soften my heart. Help me to consider you and consider what really is important in life going forward. We commit to you this time now in Jesus' name. Amen.